great people from the industry from Jenny Butler, Scott Jenstad, and Vlad Sedler. And thank you all so much as Scott instantly sees that I'm ready to do this and gets out of here. The, the, uh, terrible timing. This is all my fault, Scott. Scott, it, I'm so sorry to do you dirty like that. I didn't know. I, did, I didn't know you had just left the moment I introduced you. It's perfect. I, pl I planned it that way, so I'm, uh, I actually like it. <laughs> well, thank you all so much for being here. I believe in this community. I believe we can get to that $10,000 goal. But hey, this is... I can't wait for this panel because I actually might be be trying the NFBC this year for the first time. I'm, I'm going to see if I can maybe do that. I'm going to pair with someone else. Don't worry. I'm not doing the hitting stuff. My God. Are we, are we convinced but, you to come to Vegas to do that, I hope? Absolutely yes, not. Yes. I have avoided Vegas all my life, and I like to keep it that way. But wow. I'm going to let you guys take it away. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thanks for having us, Nick, and thanks everybody for uh, for tuning in. We always really uh, appreciate uh, appreciate the invite. Um, I am Scott Jensen. You may know me from hosting uh, the RotoWire Fantasy Baseball Podcast, uh, football podcast, a little golf podcast in there too. But uh, we're going to be talking NFBC today, talking about doing well in the NFBC. And luckily, I have uh, two really good people with me today. Uh, I'm going to let them introduce themselves, uh, just as they'll do a better job at it than I will. First, we have Jenny Butler, a high-stakes NFBC player. You may have seen her uh, roster construction piece in the FTN five-tool fantasy draft guide. The other person in this room had a little bit to do with also. Um, she's going to be writing for fan tracks and Roto, Roto Baller also this week or this year on, in, in, in season. But uh, Jenny, introduce yourself a little bit. Tell yourself, uh, tell everybody what you do in the industry and uh, what you're doing here. Hi, uh, I'm excited to be here, although I don't know how I made it on this panel with the two of you, but I'll, I'll take it. Um, yeah, I, I'm... Just started um, writing a little bit. Uh, I mostly just played on a high stakes world, doing a lot of drafts out in Vegas, a lot of NFBC. And and Vlad uh, asked me if I wanted to contribute to the draft guide this year, and I was happy to do it. And so it's hopefully started me off on a little bit of writing work. And you famously were in Vegas with me in the league where we had the rogue draft in our league. The rogue draft uh... league. <laughs> still a little offended. Still offended. You didn't come up and say hi, but uh, we'll, we'll hopefully fix that this year in, in Vegas. But that was a uh, that was a wild a wild league that continues to live <laughs> on in, in infamy on Twitter. So it's uh, it's always fun. Um, it is something I will always be able to say that I was a part of. Yeah, it was a it was a it was a wild <laughs> one. It was a good one. There was a lot of strange stuff going on in that league. But uh, our other uh, our other person on the panel today is a stranger to no one. Vlad Sedler, one of the better high stakes players in the entire world. Uh, he is the head of fantasy baseball at FTN. Uh, put together that FTN draft guide that I mentioned earlier that Jenny uh, wrote in. I think everybody knows Vlad from being the nicest person in the world on Twitter to everybody, even those who don't deserve it, which I'm always impressed by because I am nowhere near as nice as he is. Known him forever. One of my better friends, uh, definitely one of my better friends in the industry. Uh, Vlad, introduce yourself. Tell people where they can find your work, et cetera. Hey, Scott, thank you so much for the very kind intro. Jenny, good to see you. Really looking forward to to this panel here today discussing our our favorite thing, NFBC strategy and, and, and how to crush it. Uh, I can be found at on Twitter at RotoGut and uh, FTNFantasy.com is the website where we just have a whole bunch of preseason goodness. We'll take care of you during the, during the regular season and uh, a lot of focus on NFBC strategy specifically. So looking yeah. forward to it. And I'm going to try to drive us through here and let you guys, uh, you know, really get the analysis going. We're going to talk preseason. We're going to talk draft day. We're going to talk in season. We're going to talk fab. We'll end with fab, which I know is what everybody always asks about, always wants to talk about, uh, especially uh, Vlad is known very well for knowing, uh, for being a really good fab player. I think everybody in the NFBC, if you're going to do well, you have to do that. Um, I don't know what shirt he's showing off, but hopefully it does not say Fab Whisper because <laughs> then I'm going to be really uh, making fun of him the whole time. Oh, uh, is that in fab we trust? It is. <laughs> Good Lord, we're off to a bad start. Um, So uh, we're going to talk everything. Uh, we'll, we'll, start, we'll start to talk preseason. Now, everybody talks about on Twitter, everybody's like, oh, I'm doing my draft prep. I'm, I'm prepping for the NFBC. I'm prepping for my local league. I'm prepping for my home league, whatever it may be. What does that mean for you guys? Uh, you know, I'll kind of weigh in after you guys talk, but like, how do you kind of jump into getting ready for drafts? You know, everybody is busy. Everybody's got school or kids or work or whatever's going on. Everybody has lots of stuff to do. To do well in this stuff takes a lot of time. And I think, you know, prepping efficiently is like the most important thing. But how do you guys really jump in and get ready, you know, in these two, three months leading up to the, these big events in March? How do you guys, uh, how do you guys kind of start your draft prep? Jenny, we'll start with you. Yeah, uh, for me, I, I mostly wait until a set of projections come out, come out, usually steamer. Um, and then I start putting together my draft spreadsheet, um, which then I sort of tweak on and off until, you know, right about now when ATC and the bat come out or when I really sort of lock it down. 
And then, you know, my, my basic process is just sort of go through each position and try to sort of take it from a thousand foot view, I guess. I don't get into the weeds of player by player as much as a lot of other people do, I think. Um, I tend to sort of trust the projections and take a look at what they're telling me and what, you know, what I can take from it, the, you know, the big picture um, lessons that I can take from those projections. So, and a lot of it is also dependent on AD, ADP. So as the ADP shifts during the course of the off season, I then take another look and another look and another look to see how my opinions on players are adapting, you know, because by the time, you know, we go to Vegas, there are some uh, main event ADP I think it'll be, out, I think and that's what I think it'll really be fun because I think I think all three of us kind of prep a little differently. Vlad, how do you kind of jump in? I know that you uh, you have your VDPs out, uh, your own projections, and how do you kind of start getting into stuff? Do you do you build those from scratch? Do you tweak them from other projections? How do you kind of jump in and make your rankings? I think you're the one of the three of us that actually like has their rankings out there publicly. Yeah, I mean, I, I first thing is I always like to take a little bit of a break after the World Series just to kind of regroup. And for me, it's really difficult to just jump right back into drafting uh, just because I want to have that that mental reset, uh, even though I'm I, I'm making sure to take the lessons learned from the previous season. Uh, I'm obviously learning from from my mistakes, from from uh, from others mistakes and just looking at things that are, are common from the previous season um, as far as it, what the winners had done and had that how that has been different from, from previous seasons, uh, looking forward to, to future trends of this season that I might be able to identify. Uh, those are things that I'm looking to do, but that's after a little bit of a break. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, the, the real best way that I get, get uh, start my, my work is by just jumping into drafts. This is after Thanksgiving. I'm drafting, uh, jumping into the 50 round draft and holds. And that way I'm getting a feel for uh, the, for the marketplace for ADP for, for tier drop-offs, um, and then I start to have a good feel of the player pool. Um, right around now, end of January at this point, uh, is when draft software comes in for with Rotolab. And though I like and I appreciate all of the projections, uh, I try to use it uh, those as an opportunity for me to see where I differentiate. But that's after I sort of build um, the way that I see it and then compare uh, and, and tweak. And, and so I try not to use projections as a jumping off point. Uh, I want to kind of uh, uh, not be biased in that regard. And then that's really truly how I'm able to identify who I think are majorly overvalued or, or undervalued players. Yeah, it's funny. We've all had, you know, success in the FBC and we all do things very differently. Jenny, uh, you know, is, is into the projections. Vlad's kind of building his own thing and a little feel in there um, and drafts early. I don't draft early at all. I famously don't. I don't draft anything until March. Maybe the TGFBI that Justin Mason runs because just it happens to be in February. But I don't do any money or paid leagues until March. I, I, I'm like you. I like to take a break, but I take a longer break. I kind of need to decompress. Uh, I'm watching football, basketball, that kind of stuff. and just not taking a break away from baseball. But when I get into my prep, you know, I'm looking at, uh, I'm looking at ADP and not as a guide or anything like that, but more, and it sounds kind of stupid and simple, but I'm really just looking player by player. And I'm looking for guys that I like more than the field. And I like less than the field. That's kind of how I build everything. And it's just, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people that like, I like middle. There's a lot of people like, oh, that ADP seems about right. You know, if I'm in the right spot, if I need the right things, I'll grab that player. But I'm really looking for targets and fades and trying to build my draft sheet. So I build my own draft sheet, but I don't really build it by projections. I don't really build it by ADP. I just kind of a little bit of a feel, a little bit of numbers and a lot of, you know, player by player. There's a lot of stats that I particularly look at. I was going to ask you guys that. Are there any particular stats? Like what are your focuses on? You're, and you're looking at players. And you're like, I want to see if I like someone more or less in the field. What uh, what stats do you find yourself kind of honing in on? Because I think that nowadays on, you know, baseball savant and, and fan graphs, there's so much information, so much more than we had even 10, 15 years ago. Um, that I think people can get overwhelmed by how many different numbers there are. And what exactly do I look at? You see people, you know, talk about one stat on Twitter. And it's never one stat. But what do you guys, are, is there anything like you, three or four stats you guys really hone in on when you're trying to figure out who you want to draft this year? Well, for me, I, I actually like the kinds of stats that sort of sum up a lot of different skills. So like I personally use SGP a lot to compare with uh, ADP. So I will use um, SGP and then I also use the thing, the um, auction calculators on fan graphs to look, you know, run it for each of the different sets of projections and sort of use that to compare to ADP to sort of get a, an overall summary of how I how the player compares to where they're going. Vlad, what about you? Uh, yeah, I mean, were, were you also talking about like uh, like statistics specifically? Yeah, and, yeah, and either 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 yeah. way, or yeah, I mean, it, whatever uh, whatever you want to answer with, it works. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 really a blend. Uh, it, it, 
for me, it's it's important to have an uh, an overall feel. Like you know, we we play so many years. We're, we're following these players closely, and obviously, we have inherent biases towards certain players and against others. Uh, but I want to. I like to try to keep an open mind on all players, and I like to dig in specifically on players that I may not uh, have been necessarily interested in, or I might know. Or I know I might have an, that inherent bias towards. I, I think an example of that was uh, was was Reese Hoskins, who. Uh, for whatever reason, just came into draft season like I am not really interested. And then at some point, you got to ask yourself why and then dig in a little bit and kind of find that balance to see uh, where they are in relation to the market, not necessarily in relation how you personally uh, feel about them. But, um, you know, of course, I like to I- incorporate, uh, you know, the new statistics like on in pitcher list, uh, what, you know, Nick and Alex had created with uh, with CSW pr- uh, rate, um, obviously a, a little bit of, of stat cast and uh, and fan graphs and. And, and for me, even just basic things like uh, yeah, I'm looking at, at, at isolated power, you know, splits, uh, specifically, you know, lefty versus righty. And uh, to, to try to get a feel for a player, um, what kind of impact they're going to have on their lineup, uh, because that's one of my most recent lessons is learning that, you know, hey, these these lefty hitters that don't hit lefty pitching very well, I need to be careful with them. They may end up, you know, falling into platoons and perhaps my plate appearance projections on them is uh is a little too high or sometimes they just stink against lefties and and, and drive in 100 runs anyways uh like <clears throat> austin meadows <laughs> yeah your your boy austin meadows is how we, we call him by the way yeah i'm i'm, I'm kind of in the middle also again i, I i'm more i'm I've, I've built my fan graphs i have a, the custom uh you, you in the top you can kind of build the custom stats you want in there um for pitchers, I'm a big, uh, I'm big strikeout rate, walk rate, very simple. I like swinging strike rate, but like you know, kind of building a bunch of stuff. And then if I get someone that I'm like, I can't really figure this guy, then I'll jump into you know the deeper stat cast numbers and look at the you know pitches and where the velocity is going, all that kind of stuff. And then hitters, um, I do like the stat cast stuff, but for me, it's on the extremes. Like when I'm looking at hard hit rate, barrel rate, that kind of stuff. It's uh, the middle. I think can kind of get muddled up a little bit. You know, guys can move up a little around, but you get someone that's you know that top five to ten percent regularly, or the bottom five to ten percent regularly. I've had a lot of t- discussion with people on on Twitter last couple years about Victor Robles. I just don't think he hits the ball well enough to, to be a good major league player um, and stay on the field. It's not like it's fantasy wise. I get it. You can run and all that kind of stuff, but like stay on the field. You've got to be able to do something. Uh, you got to be able to do something for your team. And, you know, it, it's either you lose your job or you move down the lineup and both of those affect us obviously from a fantasy perspective. So uh, when I look at those stats, I'm really looking extreme. So I want, I want guys that really, you know, show something at the top or at the bottom and consistency there is where I really start to notice uh, some of those stats. But um, how, how about you guys decide what you're going to play before you get to draft day? Like, are you playing? Uh, do, I don't know what you guys exactly play. Do you play 15 team or 12 team or you just do a couple leagues? Are you someone that plays a lot of leagues? How do you kind of figure out game selection in the NFBC? There's a lot of offerings. There's a lot of stuff to play. How do you guys kind of figure out how many of these you're going to play, where you're going to play that, that sort of thing? I'm pretty fine tuned at this point as far as the, the 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 contest that I like, and then it's just a matter of uh, self discipline, being able to uh, you know to stick <laughs> you, the budget. You, ha- you have none, by the way, just so we're clear. Yeah, this is correct. Uh, but you know, as, as the family starts growing and, and things start getting busy, you, you want to be mindful of the number of teams that uh, that you're you're playing. That does include FAB because uh, FAB takes time and, and effort. And to do well in the leagues, you need to make sure that you can can cover all the FAB and just not you know throwing bids in uh, at the last minute before the Sunday deadline. Um, as far as games that I like, I have a sort of a flow where I start off with the 15 teamers, uh, the draft champions, because they are a slow draft, uh, and I can uh, basically research along the way. Uh, it, at a certain round, I'm looking at a set of players. I have a little bit of time to dig into them. Of course, don't take the two, you know, whole two hour clock. But uh, so I'm in the 15 team mode, and then right around this time, uh, switch over to uh, to to do a little bit of cut line. So you know, the cut lines is a best ball points format. You have to completely shift your your, your focus, attention, rankings, everything, uh, strategy to that format. Uh, then I slide into the, uh, the the 12 teamers. That's the the online championships. Uh, those are a huge overall contest with a, a very large, I believe, 175 or 200 thousand dollar grand prize. Uh, I like to enter a few of those, and I like to spread out when I draft those. Uh, you know, definitely save a couple towards the end of the uh, uh, of the preseason. And then from the 12s, I like to transition back into the 15. So I don't like to mix and match too much with the 12s and 15s, just so I can stay on focus on a specific type of format. And the 15s is, again, it's, it's kind of taking it all back to where I started with the draft champions. And all of this is in preparation for the main event where uh, we you know, we go out every year in Vegas, some draft in New York, others in Chicago. Um, so that's my sort of my cycle from 15s all the way back to 15s. Jenny, how about you? 
So last year, I decided to cut out 12 team leagues, uh, 12 team fab leagues, I should say. I still play in um, some best balls, but I just decided that trying to do both 12 and 15 team fab was too much work for me. I just wanted to focus on the 15 team player pool. So for me, I usually start um, at this time of year doing some best balls and I do play in those are 12 teams, but it's just such a completely different format and there's no fab. So um, I do a lot of best ball 12s and then I'll probably do one or two draft champions. Um, I feel like people get very uh, into the draft champions and do a lot of them. And I don't understand how people can do that. That's just I mean, setting that many lineups is is not feasible for me. I don't know. I mean, especially with the variability of, of game start times on Mondays and Fridays. But um, so then, but once I'm done with the best balls, I'll do one or two draft champions and then just kind of move into 15 team fab mode, you know, the, the um, main event. And I'm also, I also last year did uh, an auction championship in Las Vegas and I loved it. So I'm going to do nice. uh, that again this year. How many 15 team fab leagues is, is enough for you? Uh, I, th I wanted it to be five this year and I think it's going to end up being six, but six is my absolute max. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm at four for fab leagues. I do usually do two 15 team main events and then two 12 teamers. I just, I find myself getting buried and kind of lose myself on Sunday. Some people are better at that than I am. And I, I, I fully admit that, but, uh, we will get into fab and how to be efficient with that a little bit later. So we'll, we'll kind of help there too. What about live versus online drafts? Are you guys a big proponent of live drafts? Do you prefer the online? I know that, uh, some people, uh, you know, don't like live. Some people love live. How do you guys kind of feel about, uh, about the two different formats there? I have a huge preference for live drafts. Like I, most of, I think all of the leagues that I'm going to do this year, the, the fab leagues, well, except for TGFBI will be um, live. So we're going to do Glarf live this year. And then I'm going to do two main events and two auction championships in uh, Vegas. And I will try to do live as much as I possibly can. The, the lives are great. I think they're more difficult. I mean, it, there's a lot to be said for when your pick comes up, there's 14 people that are staring at you and you have to make a pick. And there is that feeling of, boy, I really want to make this one a good one. I want to make the room really interesting and make, make, make the room, uh, you know, amazed by my picks. And there is that. So it's hard to get used to that. I think the first year there's uh, I, I was definitely nervous. My first year is weird. Like how do you get nervous for a fancy baseball? I think draft? they're I, easier. I find them easier. Wow. I, 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 I much, I much prefer them, but I just think that the ability to like have all your computers set up and all your stuff at home and, you know, comfort of all that, I think it's just a lot easier, but um, that's interesting you say that. I, I like them a I lot like more. To, I like to be able to hear the picks announced and just have just my draft spreadsheet in front of me rather than like toggling back and forth. Even if I'm just have two screens and I'm looking back and forth, I'd rather just hear the picks, mark them down and just keep an eye on my spreadsheet rather than um, that constantly looking back and forth to the draft room. Vla Vlad's yeah. buddy, Vlad's buddy, Dave McDonald in the chat said that I need to, I need to start uh, talking so fast. I think he needs to start listening faster. So I'm not <laughs> going to change my ways there. Uh, Vlad, how, how about you? How do you feel about live versus online? Uh, I, I love both. I think that, uh, the, for me, the live events, I think there's there's absolutely nothing better than them. And uh, it's one of those things that's it's once you've gone and you have attended once, especially the one in Las Vegas when there's the Hall of Fame announcement and 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 you get to basically realize how friendly all the girls and, and guys are in, in, in the community, um, it, it's hard to not want to go back. So I, I really do love it in that format. Um, I personally love uh, the main events and the way I treat it, it's like, the movie, maybe some of the younger crew doesn't remember this, but uh, the wizard, the you know the kid, the video game championship, that tournament. God, like, how 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 old are you? Uh, I'm I'm a little over forty. Jeez, that's but an old reference right there. Think of anything as far as like just you're just it's like the main event, and that's how I feel, right? Like I'm not a professional athlete. I'm not going to the World Series. Um, so, but this is it for me. Like, I'm just like focused. I'm in the zone. Got all, you know, all of our friends there. And then like when I'm, once I sit down, I'm locked in everything that I've been working for is this is the moment and I can't like let anything slip. I got to be, you know, I'm on my absolute a game. Uh, you know, obviously you got, uh, people coming up sometimes and, uh, it, you know, almost like a video game, like trying to throw, tri you know, trip you up, uh, cause they're done with their draft. They're on break and they come, you're still focusing on your 20th round and make your pick. You're like, Hey Vlad, how's the draft going? good I and mean, you got to kind of keep going keep focusing um I, but, I i admit i do the opposite i tend to start chatting and get a little bit lost and i have to really work on that the last 10 rounds because they do really matter but that's a good segue into that draft day how do you guys we're talking about live events here how do you guys show up at the draft some people are like you know two computers some people are like 
you know, one spreadsheet. Some people have, you know, their whole board built out. Like it's a, it's very different at everybody at the table. And you get kind of some old school pen and paper. You get some people who are on their computers running, you know, Roto Lab or the Roto Wire draft stuff, whatever, whatever you may use. But how do you guys sit at the table? Like I think you can get to the point where you have too much stuff. Like there's times I've been at drafts where like I'm going to keep track of everybody's draft. I'm going to cross everybody off. I'm going to enter my team. I'm going to keep my projections. And I find myself like kind of hurrying and you just, it's just, it's just a bad feeling. So I've, I've kind of cut that back. I use kind of one computer screen and my, and my draft sheet to, and, I, and I kind of go with that. And I, I really try and focus on, you know, making sure I cross everybody off, making sure I know what's going on, make sure my, my team needs that it's worked a lot better for me to not have too much going on. But how do you guys kind of at the draft at the table, you know, kind of what's your process there? I uh, come in with one spreadsheet that I create over the course of the off season. I try to just compile as much useful information there as I can. So, you know, I have some stats, I have projections, um, auction values. I try to get in there um, where I think you guys are going to be in the lineup, um, position eligibility, obviously, stuff like that. And I set it up. Uh, I started it last year and I didn't get it done in time, but I set it up this year to automatically cross off players for me. So I can enter them in one place and it will cross them off everywhere, which is nice. nice. I'm, I've, it's been really nice during uh, online best ball drafts. So I'm hoping that that'll help me out. And then the only other thing really that I do is I keep track of my own team. I sort of copy and paste uh, the guys from each of my spreadsheet tabs into one place to sort of generate my own team so that I can keep track of where I am uh, with categories. That's 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 really good. I like the, the cross off everywhere. And I think I keep track of my own team, too. I think especially in an NFBC type format where you have an overall competition, uh, balance is important. You know, you're trying not to punt categories. It's really hard to compete overall if you do. I think that the one thing, uh, the one piece of advice I definitely get from this little part is that make sure you're keeping track of your own team. You need to know, like, are you down in steals? Are you down in home runs? And not to freak out, but like if you're in round eight and you're like, mm, you, and you're like most of Vlad's teams don't have any steals after round eight. You got to figure that out and, and kind of know where you're going in that spot. So keeping track of your team is super important some people are really good they keep track of all the teams that's not me i need to focus a little better but uh how about vlad how about you are you uh are you a pen and paper your computer where are you at these days uh, at the at, at the end of the day, or at least a few years ago, if you recall, I would have my sort of final cheat sheet, uh, ranking sheet by position. I would get it all on one page. Back when I was really bad at Excel, uh, you know, Russ Prentice would whip it up for me. And then back when I didn't have a printer, uh, before we would drive out to Vegas, you and I, Scott, uh, I yep. would email it to you to, to print out. So uh, times have changed a little bit. Um, I now actually employ a, a Rotolab draft software. So by the time those drafts are, are up and ready, I have everything finalized in there per my projections, per my, my rankings, tier sheets, everything. It's in there. And then I've now got into the habit of entering every single pick as the draft is going. So it's another reason why I kind of need to stay focused. Hard to do it first, something you need to practice online, but I've sort of mastered it for being there at the draft. And I don't know if it's necessary, but I just do it. Uh, and and so I know exactly where all the teams are are at per my projections. And so also I'm able to keep track of, um, of, of categories, targets that I need to focus on. Um, and then of course I come with some idea of how I'm going to draft those first few rounds uh, because I already know my, my KDS draft slot. How are you as you're like two or three picks away from your pick? Are you like, all right, I have three players here. I'm going to take one of them. Are you like, oh, I have one person here. I need them. And you're just to suddenly pretend you don't hear everybody else at the draft table. How do you guys, how do you guys deal with like the stress of like two or three picks away? I got to figure out what I'm making my pick. Do you wait until the person next to you picks? How do you kind of feel about that? Especially in a live draft where you got a minute and everybody looking at you. I mean, I think I it's just, important. Yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say, I think it's just important to, to, to be able to stay flexible. And uh, the absolute worst thing you can do is to be sort of too fixated on a specific player. I know it's happened sometimes where you're just focused on, don't take this player, don't take this player. And then when it happens, you're thrown off. So you have to kind of shift that, that time to figuring out what your options are. And especially like before in the, uh, the NFBC platinum drafts. So, uh, you know, when I had partnered with those before is, during the draft, I'm almost writing down uh, the next set of options and my picks and cross them off as they're taken. So I have a good idea of what's left and then what direction I need to go into. That was almost exactly what I was going to say. Um, they, you know, it, I think that the more prep, the more prepared you are, the more less likely you are to get flustered. So I just, you know, as it, it's coming down towards me, you know, three picks away, I'll have sort of a priority of three, two, one. And, you know, if, the top choice gets taken, then you take the next guy. But the more prepared you are to sort of be able to pivot when things um, don't quite go the way you planned, you, you won't get as flustered. And I learned that from going to those drafts and getting flustered and realizing how much it hurt me that, you know, I can't let that happen. 
Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think that my, my first year doing it live, I think there's like three different times I got flushers. I was like, oh my gosh, so that was exactly who I was going to take. And now I've got to look down and, and try to make a pick that that works as well. And it, it's tough. I think you really have, it's experience. You really have to, you know, be able to be flexible, I think is the key. Like at every point of the draft, if your player goes, if your target you've been talking about for two months on podcast goes, you've got to be able to figure out and, and figure out to do what's next. But before we get into some in-season stuff, I want you guys to each give me uh, give me one draft day, uh, draft day gem tip that people can use as they're starting to draft uh, coming up in March. Vlad, we'll start with you. Give me one. A, a, a tip for during the draft? Yeah, during the draft or draft prep, something preseason I mean, that's going to take away from this and be like, you know, that really helped me out right there. I mean, I think uh, w- with NFBC, because it is the, you, you do know your draft slot ahead of time. I think mapping out different scenarios is very important. And a lot of people say, oh, you know, you map out the three, the first three, four rounds. I think you, you sort of do it beyond that. And it doesn't have to be specific, but you at least know uh, you have a pretty good idea of what's going to happen. And then you can also uh, create scenarios for you know the, the worst case scenario. All your players in those range, all your targets uh, get taken. What would I do in that case? And which direction would I go in? Um, so I think that's that, that's really important, understanding the, the value uh, pocket tiers and uh, knowing how you would attack the draft, even in the first 10 rounds, even in the first 20. Jenny? Well, Vlad took my pick, so I'm gonna have to pivot. And I'm gonna say, <laughs> <There you> go. <laughs> I'm gonna say, um, make sure that you keep a very close eye on injuries, especially like morning of the draft. I mean, I don't know. There was a lot going on during the Rogue Drafter draft, but the especially, thing that I was gonna say, especially it, second second baseman for the Reds. Yeah, especially when yeah you are not paying attention, and that was my first. So I had been to live drafts in Vegas before but I hadn't been to the Saturday morning live draft. And so I got there and I kind of wandered around and I said hi to people. And I, you know, took a bathroom break, got a drink and then sat down to draft should have spent that time looking at the news and looking at injuries because I did not know that Scooter Jeanette had gotten hurt the day before and left the game. And I drafted him in the eighth round and that threw me off big time. So I, you know, I can't, I can't let that happen again. Yeah, that was rough. Like he left the game, but I think like round 15, it came out that he was missing eight weeks. So it was like, yeah, yes, you should have known that he tweaked something, but I don't, you didn't, you wouldn't have known that he was out two months. So that was, a, that was a really bad break. I do remember that. It's probably my fault. We're, Brian Slack and Nick Sack <laughs> and I were down there drinking Perrier and talking a lot. So it's probably our fault too. And the, the rogue drafter was doing his thing. I have never in, I've done what, like 13 years in Vegas. I've never drafted someone who's already been taken. And I did the seventh round that draft because it was just utter chaos. Cause the rogue drafter it was, was so, like, it was, there were papers everywhere. The guy next to me was getting pissed off and like slamming his table. Every time someone made a pick, like, it was, it was crazy. And I, I never do that. And I did that. So I think that, uh, that draft, uh, I was allowed. Sure was all off. But, yeah. yeah. Uh, my one tip would be, and the most important thing for me is when you when you're doing the when you're learning the player pool and get ready for drafts, is find pockets of value, and that works for me both in positions and stats. So at any any point in the draft, you know things happen. You know the first five rounds go a little differently. You know if I need a corner infielder in the round ten to fifteen, like I know exactly where I'm going. If I need a middle infielder in round fifteen to twenty, I know which uh, you know which groups of guys I'm going with. If I need steals late, I know where I'm going. If I need power late, if I need whip late, like I think at every stat. And every position, you need to know where you need to pivot away from if you, if you get foiled in the start of the draft. Or you, sometimes you get up a draft, and I think Vlad and I have had this, where suddenly you have three outfielders, and they all failed you in the first five rounds. You're like, this is not how I plan to start, but I couldn't pass this value up in the in round five. And it's just, I have to make it fit because it's too good. And you've got to be able to adjust to that and know, like, if I somehow miss the closers in the first five rounds, where am I going? If I miss mm-hmm. strikeouts, where can I get them later? Where, you know, maybe I'm not getting the ratios I want, but I'm getting those strikeouts. So I think making sure you have your pockets of value set up both position and stat wise is something that has helped me a ton as I've, I've drafted, especially live. Cause you do get flustered. Like Jenny Steph st- said, stuff happens. Um, you got to be able to adjust on the fly. I think pivoting to that is what the really, really good players in this contest do. Scott drafting in round 12. Uh, I'll take the boring player round 13. I'll take the boring player. <laughs> boring but good. Boring yeah. but good. Where Vlad's in round 12 is like, what single A prospect had 38 stolen bases in <laughs> September last year? And I can grab them and, and be the smartest guy, right? I, it's so funny that we, 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 Vlad and I joke around obviously a lot. We both have done really well and could complete, like we would never draft the same team. It's so funny. We would never end up with the same players, but at the end of the year, we, we usually end up uh, doing pretty well. So it's funny how, and it's a good lesson right there. Like there are 9 million ways to attack this. You look at teams that win over when the overall win their leagues, it's never perfect. It's never the same path. It's always different. Some people build the fab. Some people have a great draft and then figure it out. But it's just, uh, it, it's funny how 
you just uh, – it's just so many different ways to attack this. There's no way to be perfect. You're going to have a top 10 pick that sucks or gets hurt. It's going to happen. And the great thing about baseball is you can adjust from that. So, yeah, uh, Don't just you copy know, what Phil Dussault did last year. Yeah, It's not going to work good. for all of us. I'm going to need to <laughs> – it puts something in my brain that allows me to run Excel like that. Otherwise, I might be in yeah. trouble. So yeah. uh, one quick question from the chat room before we get into in-season management. Someone said, can you uh, recommend a good player news aggregator to avoid missing out on an injury? Thanks. Uh, I'm biased here. I do a lot of work for Rotowire. I would say Rotowire. I always, I have the Rotowire MLB page, the player news thing loaded on my phone or my computer, whatever whatever the Wi-Fi situation is in a live draft. I just have that loaded and I hit refresh every once in a while. And if I have a player that I'm I'm like, wow, this player slipped around. Like what's going on? I'll literally, they have a search field. I'll put in, you know, Bellinger and, and just see, you know, what the latest news and make sure there wasn't something yesterday, like Jenny mentioned with Scooter Jeanette that I did miss, you know, with, with the list of in spring training, there's so many injuries that I always put the, the name in the search field. Just make sure I didn't miss something from yesterday. Do you guys have a, uh, you don't want to want to pitch your own thing there? I use Red wire too. I just, Beautiful. the one thing I, I do is just before I draft a guy, just type his name in and check him specifically. But even like the day before, just run through that news and make sure you aren't seeing anything new. Yeah. Same. I mean, same wrote a wire. I think, uh, and if BC sports says you can get for, for, for free. Uh, and then, uh, of course the, the, this, uh, what's the other one called? Uh, oh, Google, Google. It's not a news <laughs> aggregator, but still. That's yeah. And, and even, and even Twitter, like I'll throw in, you know, Cody Bellinger to Twitter and see if there's anything that happened yesterday or like, Five minutes ago. That's the one thing with Twitter is like if Bellinger leaves a game, tweaks a hamstring early, like it's going to be on Twitter 14 times in the last five minutes. So that that is something that, uh, you know, you just throw the search field there during a draft. That's a really fast way to do things that I, that I find myself doing stuff. So, so we talked about draft day a bunch, but I think, uh, you know, the great thing about the NFBC is you, you, you ain't winning your draft at your winning your league, just the draft. Like you, you can't lose it there, but you're not going to win it there. In season management is massive. We have, you have these 15 team main event leagues where every single person uh, in the league is, is committed. They're serious about this. They are, they're grinding all year long. Maybe you get a couple of people that quit towards football season, but for the most part, everybody's put their money in. Everybody's playing these leagues hard. So let's talk about in season. I want to start with kind of roster management, uh, you know, weekly Monday to Friday moves, how you kind of deal with that. And then we'll jump into fab at the end. Cause I think that's the longer discussion, but um, starting in roster management, the question I often get uh, before we get into moves is how do you build your bench? As you're, as you're drafting your, uh, your, you know, you're kind of doing your fab the first couple of weeks. Like what do you want on your bench? The NFBC, so people know is a seven person bench. You start, uh, you start 23 players, 14 hitters, nine pitchers. So you only have seven bench spots. There is no, IR spot. There's nothing like that. You can't stash rookies on a, you know, there's an NA spot that's uh, something like Yahoo have that sort of thing. Uh, Jenny, start with you. How do you like, you have a seven person bench, obviously injuries change that during season, but going into the season, what does your bench look like in, in an optimal situation? My ideal bench and what I like to come out of the draft with is uh, one middle infielder, which ideally is the opposite position from the player that I have in my starting lineup at middle infield. So if I have, you know, a Perfect. second baseman, and middle infield, I try to have a shortstop on my bench, vice versa. Same with corner infield, opposite position to who's in my starting lineup. Um, and then a couple starters, maybe a reliever. I try not to have more than one stash. And a stash can be a lot of different things. It could be a prospect. For me, that's not super likely. Um, it could be a you know, closer stash and waiting. It could be um, a guy that has uh, good matchups in the first couple of weeks that I know that I'll just use right at the beginning of the season and then drop. But um, yeah, I like to keep it kind of filled up so that uh, I have maximum flexibility with setting lineups. That was a great answer, by the way. Yeah. Uh, yeah, very, very much so. Um, I think one thing I, I try not to do as much is try to have a set. I'm going to have four pitchers and three hitters of my seven. I think uh, that's sort of an antiquated uh, way to look at it. it. And I think it depends when you're drafting. So if you're drafting you know, 12 team OCs in February, load up your bench a little bit with uh, some more upside players that maybe we don't know much about that you think might land in the you know 25th to 30th round player pool uh, closer to March, like after spring training. That way, when everyone else is fighting for them over fab, you already have them on your roster. When you're drafting closer to the uh, end of uh, March or when most main events are, you want to have the first f uh, few weeks in mind for, uh, for example, pitching uh, two-step starting pitchers, making sure you have coverage on your, your bench for a, a, a midweek move for, um, you know, maybe somebody's going to, you know, to, to face the Orioles or, or, or going to course, um, you know, those are the type of things I guess we'll get into more in a bit, but I think it's also important early in the season to kind of get off to a good start and make sure you have your first couple weeks of lineups covered. The last thing I'll mention is, uh, you can even look ahead. I remember what was it two seasons ago, maybe it was 2019. It was, uh, 
Alex Wood, for me, I was looking ahead in the schedule and he was playing for the Dodgers at the time. And at this time, this is before San Francisco uh, Giants were amazing and they were a good team to stream against. Uh, and so I noticed that Alex Wood was going to have two, uh, a two step the first full week against San Francisco both times. So nobody was really drafting him. He was going in, you know, 25th round. And so I just made sure to grab him on every team as one of my last pitchers so I could use him at that point. So looking a little bit into the schedule, I think uh, early on is important as well. Yeah, you're really good at that too. I usually, as we're driving to Vegas or those last couple of days, I usually hit you up for that info because you're really good at kind of figuring out what that second and third week look like. And sometimes I'm so looking at the at the at the big map and like who I want for the season long that I kind of miss those last. Those, I, I've moved a lot my my last like two or three picks. I always try and figure out like maybe a guy that maybe a reliever that has four games that first half week, and maybe I'm trying to just steal a half week out of a player when you know those half weeks you get not every starter starts. So you know, give me a give me a setup guy. Maybe steals a win or a save and I could drop in that first fab. There's a lot of little strategies strategies that you can do, especially now that MLB has kind of started that half week period. But um, I think what Jetty said on the bench with the corner and middles is really important. And I think people don't really do that very often, but um, getting a different position on your bench than you have at your corner. So if you have a first and a third baseman, and then your corners are first, you know, you want to get a third baseman because your third baseman gets hurt. That's not going to help you. You can't move that corner to, to third base because of first baseman. So if you get that other position that covers corner and covers third and you have first covered also, obviously multi-position eligibility guys are really, really nice to have at this spot, especially someone that's corner and middle. Like you have someone that's second and short and cover both, but uh, someone getting someone like corner and middle, Abraham Toro is a good example of that this year. Um, when you can cover corner and middle with one player, maybe that saves you an extra spot for a stash or for an injured player. It's really, it's really nice to have those combos. And I'm with Jenny on the stashes. I very, very rarely will draft someone who's not starting the year in the major leagues. Every once in a while, like you just you have to. If someone's going to come up in two or three weeks, you think they're going to be up right away. You kind of have to. The value gets there, but I I don't find myself drafting you know pitchers that are going to get called up mid season that kind of thing. It just it eats into your uh, in, into your into your bench. People that drafted Bobby Witt Jr. last year, like he looked like he was going to be great. It just never happened. But the problem with that is you can't drop him. You know, you use that pick and he's playing so well. He's doing so well. Like, it's easy. If you take someone in the 30th round, that's a prospect. Then I would call up like his fine drop. But if you take someone in the mid round, you know, Bobby Witt obviously earlier this year, but he's going to be, we, we think he's going to be up a lot sooner or hopefully opening day. But you just can't drop someone like that. And it gets to the point where like, if I drop this week, he gets called up. Then I feel like an idiot. And he goes 15, 15 the rest of the way. So it's not only the fact that you have to hold the bench spot. It's the fact that you can't drop these guys. That makes it really tough for me to stash someone like that. I'm going to um, spend a lot more time this year, I think, looking, thinking about who I draft and how willing I will be to drop them. I want to, I don't want to pick up guys who I won't be willing to drop like injury prone guys. You know, it's if I, I'll draft them maybe late when I know that, you know, if they get hurt, I can dump them. But you know, if I, I'm not going to take a guy early that I know if he gets hurt, I'm going to have to keep him on my bench. Yeah, Similar that's to a good prospects. That's a good point. Cause there are, there are a lot of content out there about picking people up each week. And, you know, Vlad writes what I consider the best one out there with it, with his fab article every week. I don't read a ton of stuff. I don't like to get stuff too caught up in my head, but I do read Vlad's every week. It's a really good piece. If nobody reads that, but you know, figuring out who to drop is, is really important. Like it's, you, you can regret drops. You can drops can be problematic, but there's not a lot of content about that, about who to drop. So that's a, that's one of those things that I always struggle with because you just, you just don't want to be that person that drops someone and they go off to a really good season. Vlad mentioned earlier, picking up two start pitchers. How do you guys, Attack two start pitchers. Always a topic, you know, in fab articles on Twitter. Oh, this guy's going going twice a week. Pick him up. But boy, I tell you what, these people that are on the on the fab list can be can be blowups. And you know, if you get two blowups, it's even worse than one. But how aggressive are you with two star starters? Because obviously, the the theory there is you get you can have a chance of two wins. You can have a chance of a lot of strikeouts. You can get a lot of upside from getting two star guys. But um, they become they, they're dangerous. And they become more dangerous. Kind of this hitting era the last few years. Yeah, I think it's a different approach a little bit in in uh, in twelve teamers because the player pool is a different uh, it's a different group in in twelve teamers uh, it's three hundred sixty total players taken and four hundred fifty in the fifteen teamers so the quality of streaming options are um, are quite different and um, you're you're more likely to get into a uh, into a pickle with the fifteen team options and of course uh, that's a lot of ways like some gems are picked up you remember a few years ago was it twenty eighteen. Uh, Lucas Giolito was a fab guy and had that amazing season. So sometimes you do land on those gems uh, and and it happens, but more likely than not, you know, you just kind of, you don't want to start the game of I'm streaming, uh, you know, um, Bruce Zimmerman and uh, uh, Antonio Senzatella too early. So just, just random names out of nowhere. All right. The way, yeah, the way, Hey, maybe they'll be good this year, but the, the best way to do that is to have, 
your, um, you can even think about whatever your fab weaknesses are during the season. Make sure to almost try to cover that a little bit um, in your draft. So if you know you're always going to be the type to chase those $300 uh, closers, then you know, make sure you grab three or four guys or maybe take your second closer early or just make sure you have that covered. And same thing with starting pitchers. Uh, some of us have the feeling of, oh man, I'm so good at streaming uh, late pitchers or picking up late uh, p- pitchers late in a draft. Yep. And if they happen to not hit and then you start kind of streaming them, you can really get caught up in a, in a big issue. You don't necessarily need to be chasing strikeouts and wins like too early in the season. Um, and when you do, you start to get in trouble. You start to sort of forget how important ERA and whip is and, um, and just start getting smashed. How do you both deal with uh, Friday moves? The NFBC uh, a number of years ago went to Friday moves for hitters. So you can, you can, any, any offensive player you can take in and out of the lineup on Friday. Pitchers are set through the entire week, but uh, hitters you can move in and out. Uh, I am one who uses this aggressively, uses it a lot, but I was curious how you guys deal with Friday moves. Do you kind of set your lineup on Monday with the thought that I, or do you, you pick up people that I, I can use the second half of the league? How aggressive are you with the Friday moves? Obviously, if you have four injured guys in your bench, it kind of becomes irrelevant. You can't really do it as much. But how aggressive are you with moving people in and out on Fridays for weekend games? It's something that I have learned to take more advantage of over the last couple of years. Um, I used to just sort of stick with my Monday to Friday lineup unless I had injuries that I needed to replace. But I've really started this year when I'm doing fab to look at guys as instead of having a full week, look at them Monday through Thursday and look at them separately, you know, Wednesday or Friday through Sunday so that, you know, I have that plan already in mind. Obviously it doesn't always work out, but you know, I like to try and maximize as much as I can good matchups over the weekend versus, you know, having just your absolute best lineup in. Yeah, that's a really good point. And like, I'm just using an example. You've had like Rowdy Telez and you look on Friday, Saturday, mm-hmm. Sunday, you can face just two or three lefties. Like you just have to be, plan- you have to plan for that the fab before make sure that you have a corner infielder that you can put in over the weekend. Cause you don't want someone who's going to get three at bats over the weekend. But Vlad, how about you with the Friday moves? Are you super aggressive with it? Did you kind of just see how it works out? Where do you find a fall, kind of fall on those? Yeah. I always make sure to try to plan ahead. Although planning ahead doesn't always pan out because a lot of times we're looking at the upcoming pitching matchups and you see on a weekend, for example, Rowdy Tellez does get three righties coming up on the weekend uh, in, in cores or just, you know, some fantastic ballpark. And then all of a sudden, um, a rain delay early on switches things up. All of a sudden he's facing two lefties and he's on the bench and then you're in trouble. Yep. So that does happen. You, you can't always plan for those sort of things, but you can try to, you know, one thing that's important is sort of staying ahead of your competition, especially NFBC where you just have so many sharp uh, uh, people playing. It's not, you know, no one's getting away with, uh, you know, some up and comer in cores or, uh, yeah. you know, that week, you almost have to be two weeks ahead on some of that. And, at that point, you're making difficult decisions because sometimes you're looking into dropping someone you may not be be ready to drop. Or the key is just to keep your bench uh, flexible for all those options. Of course, multi position eligible guys help, but you want to just make sure whatever you do, just just put yourself in a spot to not take zeros in your starting lineup if you don't have to. And I think it's key to note that you're, we're talking about the you know the bottom half of our offense. I think that I'm not moving you know stud players out on Friday Saturday because they have bad matchups. Or if someone's you know facing you know three good pitchers, like I'm not taking those guys out. I if there's a is there a fringy guy maybe, but I I don't try and overthink that because you know pitchers get hurt, pitch stud, relievers come in. You know your good players out for the most part, unless they have like two games or have a rain out and they have one game or something weird like that. I'm leaving those people in. But those those like bottom you know six players in your roster and your three guys in your bench, like I actually track it out every week. I write down you know who they're facing. Saturday or who they're facing Friday, Saturday, Sunday, projected and kind of figure out who has the best matchups, who's been playing well. You want, obviously, players that are, you know, not in a slump. There's a lot of things that go in that Friday move, but I find that um, I think that's a big advantage. I think there's there's very few advantages anymore in, in fantasy. There's so much really good info out there that I think the, you know, the dog days of summer, people just leaving their lineups, the people on their Friday, like, oh, I've had this guy in for the whole season. I'm just going to leave him in. But like those little, you know, you know, getting a couple extra runs or a couple extra RBIs is really huge. We, we've all, we all have the stories of one run or one home run deciding a, you know, a $1,700 league on the last day. And it's not or, that home run. It's not that home run. What's that? Go or ahead. on day 163, right? Oh, or on day Does remain <laughs> die? Oh, day 163. It can be, it can be great. It can be so, so bad. Um, but yeah, you're, you're right. It comes down to, we might come down to one hit and it's not that September 30th hit. It's the May 15th weekend where you just got a little busy and you didn't put the right person in. You missed three games, a corner where the guy hit two home runs and had six RBIs. Like that's, 
That's where it's decided. Everybody looks at that last week and like, oh, I can't believe I got this Andres Torres run that won a league. That's a true story, by the way. Um, but it's it's it's, it's that it's that weekend you missed in June. It's that time in July where you're like, I don't really feel like doing fab this week. And you found yourself, you know, one middle infielder short. So it, everybody always looks at that last weekend, but it's always stuff that happens during the season that decides that. So speaking I, of that, I don't okay. feel like doing fab. That's a really, that's a really good. That's a really good segue because we're going to talk about Fab right now. Everybody, we're going to spend our last ten minutes here talking about Fab. Everybody talks about Fab. How many Fab leagues do you have? It takes so much time. I want to start with how do you guys start to do Fab? Like everybody's like, oh, what players do you want? But there's a lot that goes into it. You have to figure out what you need, what's out there, what your what you what your injuries are. You know what you, what your next week looks like. Um, so Jenny, we'll start with you. How do you kind of jump in? Like, what are you? What is your start of your Fab process? You sit down on Saturday or Sunday and try and figure stuff out. I try to kind of keep a running list throughout the week. One of the advantages to being female is I carry a purse. And so I have the ability to carry a list. I carry a piece of paper in my purse all week that I just make a running list of players to keep an eye on. They're just like, you know, if I'm I, listening I, lo- to podcasts, I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. I just add them to the list, add them to the list. And then I go back on Saturday and Sunday and start working through them. Um, usually earlier in the week, I try to get things done that I can do uh, easily. Um, like going back and looking who the drops were the week before, that's not going to change, things like that. And then I'll start, you know, Friday looking at schedules and kind of adding to my list and then start the process on Saturday and finish it on Sunday. I probably spend more time on it than most people because I have the freedom to do that. I don't have kids or anything. So I will probably spend a good eight hours on Sunday, maybe three hours on Saturday and eight hours on Sunday on Fab. Vlad, how about you? Uh, I, I, the process starts midweek. It, it's, it's not even a, a it, you're just always in, it, it's a way of life. Let's put it like that. Fab, you know, f- fab all week. Uh, no, basically you're, you're, you're keeping tabs of everything over the course of the week. You're looking at, uh, you're looking at box sports, you're watching games, you're looking at, uh, people moving into the injured list. You're looking at how people are performing as far as, uh, you know, how that's affecting them, uh, you know, where, a pitcher, a reliever might maybe move up to a higher leverage situation, be better in a, in a better position to close or a starting pitcher, uh, someone leaving a rotation, entering a rotation, a hitter where he's moving up or, or down a lineup or getting close to being sent to the minor league. So all these things I'm taking stock of over the course of the week. And then uh, what really helps me honestly is writing the, the, the fab article, which usually comes out on Saturday, uh, usually with an update on Sunday, but it really gets me to sit down on Friday, lay out the land, and then figure out what my team uh, needs are for you know those specific uh, categories, positions, and everything. And I don't want to. I really don't want to be too much of a shill for you because I don't really like to be all overly nice to you. But that the Fab article is the best thing that there is out there. Like I start with like. Yes. I'll, I'll be like, you know what? I got to jump in. I'm going to start with Vlad's article and then kind of build from there. Like I don't use his numbers. I don't use exactly his list, but it's a good way to like, it figures out everybody that's there. And like, there'll, there'll be players I forget about, or there'll be players, someone Vlad's like, you know, in, in a week and a half, they have a four game series of course. I'll be like, oh, I didn't see that. So there you go. It's like a great starting point for everything you do in fab. And I think the other thing that I want to weigh, I want to just kind of comment is that when you do fab, it's not just about the free agents. You have to look at your team. You have to look at A, who's injured, B, like what positions do you need? What stats do you need? I, I keep a running spreadsheet where I'm trending in every stat category in, in my main event leagues. Uh, I'm kind of a freak about that kind of stuff. It's a, it's a pretty scary spreadsheet when you look at it. It's, it's kind of frightening. But I can tell, you know, because nine points in stolen bases, if, you, if you've been there all year, it tells you one thing. If you had 15 three weeks ago, it can tell you you're falling. If you had one three weeks ago, it tells you you're really making a move. You don't maybe need to pick up that stolen base person. Where if you're falling, you need to address that. So I think figuring out your team first is really important in that. You know, what positions I always mark, I always kind of look at all my pitcher matchups the week and, and see if I have nine guys that I want to use that week. Like there's weeks where like, I like my starting pitching staff, but like there's only seven pitchers I can use this week. They're either, you know, even at cores or, you know, at Yankee stadium or my closer has five games or my fringy closer has five games. It's one of those things like make sure that you, you have your nine pitchers going to the week. And that really changes on, you know, if I need two pitchers, my research on starting pitchers and fab goes way deeper. Whereas if I have a team where I don't really need anybody unless they really jump out as like a guy that I have to, I have to bid on. Yeah, maybe I don't need to look at, uh, you know, the fourth starter for Washington who's getting two starts this week. So it's just, I think knowing your team and adapting to what you need can can make you a lot more efficient rather than just like jumping in and figuring out every single player in fab because you're just, you're just not going to win that way. Yeah, and I think we're always just looking to to, to, to make our team better. I think that's a, just a good approach. And sometimes you want to be uh, responding proactively as a, in, in, instead of reactively and and just remember that it's a, it's a full season. The way that I like to also do it is consider it a uh, like a you know 26 
mini seasons, so to speak, or, you know, however you want to break it up. But uh, you, you kind of have that, that macro goal, you know what you want to do, but you also need to attack it in those, uh, those small little chunks. Yeah. And I think 15 and 12s are a little bit different. Jenny mentioned, you know, they're very different fab leagues to the point that she's kind of stopped playing one or the other because they're hard to do. I tend to start with my 15s. So I know the whole player pool. And then I jump mm -hmm. in the 12s and always looks like, oh my God, look at all these people that are available. But, you know, I think that the bottom part of my 12 team, I'm, I'm more willing to drop people and pick people up maybe for a, for a hot streak or a great matchup just because you, that bottom part of your 12 is always going to be people that are available. Where to 15, like it's maybe hard to find a corner for a month. Like last year I had, I couldn't find a first baseman forever. And I just mm -hmm. cycled guys in that weren't good. And a 12 or I could have picked up five people that would have would have sufficed so it's uh you know 15 and 12s there's definitely kind of different where you're looking at. i think at 12 you're looking for really the kind of that boom free agent pick when a 15 you might be looking at someone that's going to you know get you at bats and start so um jenny i think the most important thing you did from this whole speech is that now paul spore is planning to bring a purse to vegas with him so there's we got that yes. going for us, just nice do it um uh, so how, how about bidding amounts? I think you know, I'm going to start with Vlad on this because he's, he's kind of a, he's, we talk, everybody calls him the fab whisperer. I do not do that. I want to make sure that I don't call him that. Um, but Vlad always has, you know, I look at, it, it's amazing. He's always got bids every week where he beats someone by $2 or $1. How do you, how do you do that? How do you, is it just feel, is it, are you studying the other people in your league? Are you picking a certain number to end your bid on? How do you end up with those, those one and $2 wins that seems to be more than most people? I mean, listen, it's, it's also, and it's really nice and I appreciate it, but also it's, uh, it's funny how this past season I've, I've had the, the biggest, uh, the, the widest ranges between basically the most overspending that I have ever done, just kind of overbidding on players. And I don't know how that happened, but, um, okay. So, you know, that's, that's not a good sale for myself, but again, just being real, just being real. It's it, this past season was really tough in overestimating uh, the market. And, and part of it was knowing that I was overspending a little bit, but really just making sure that I was getting the players that I wanted. Uh, and I wanted to kind of stress that early, but as far as strategy, obviously a lot of us have played against one another for a long time. We may not know all each other's bidding tendencies, but we know the certain range, like what it would take in general, like uh, a new closer pops in. Like we know for a fact, uh, you know, let's say Camilo Duvall and Jake McGee both get hurt, uh, in the first day. And, you know, nobody has Tyler Rogers, you know, Tyler Rogers is going to be going for, you know, 200, 300, 400 plus. You have to think about it in relation to uh, your team and your team needs. And you need to think about the fact that, Hey, it's week one. There might be other guys like that coming uh, in the future. And also maybe Jake McGee is just, you know, he'll be back in after a quick 10 day IL stint and then that'll switch. So I'm almost kind of overspending. So the first thing people have to know is that when, uh, when, a new player comes on fab or becomes like a big market, uh, you know, something, uh, something that everybody wants. He's automatically overvalued. You need to figure out where they land in relation to your team. You don't need to have all the toys. It's a very long season. You need to, you know, kind of, kind of spread it out. Um, but as far as the, the bidding amounts, the only thing I will recommend is that you switch it up because I think people are looking closer to like, okay, I know, uh, you know, the, somebody you know this person in my league is always ending their bids with 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 a nine so i'm just going to go with a one or a zero with the, you know the next amount so yeah. keep switching that up as well i think that's very important jenny how about you how do you kind of figure out that 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 last bid and figure out where if you're going you know 27 or 29 or 31 or is it just kind of feel how do you how do you kind of deal with that uh it's more just a feel but i i generally don't bid uh over a hundred dollars much off very often on anyone um, I like to kind of keep it conservative at the beginning of the season and then, you know, have the hammer later if I really need it um, and try just to sort of win by win by a dollar. I think it's is it Fred Zinke that says, you know, I aim to be second in all of my bids, you know, and that way you can the ones that you win, you're meant to win. You know, I like that advice. I try to keep it conservative. Yeah, my advice on that and the way I go with it is if I click on the fab result page and I, I won the player, I'll be happy. Like, I don't want to ever click on that page and be like, oh, my bid won. Like, I clearly bid too much. So it's always a number where if I get the player, I feel good about it. I'm happy about it. Sometimes that, you know, a little more than you're comfortable with. But some of these early guys, you know, every once in a while. And if you get a big a big difference maker. I lost a league a couple years ago because someone outbid me for Carlos Correa when he got called up. And I bid in the 500s and someone bid the 600s. And it ended up costing me winning that league. So there are times where, you know, having that, having that money and going big does pay out but jenny your comment earlier on the uh on having the hammer late how do you deal with like how much do you want fab wise for the second half of the season i mean often also make or how much do you want for september obviously that changes and based on what your team needs sometimes you have to bid on a closer like it doesn't always work out but like in a perfect optimal situation what do you want say at the all-star break and what do you want say let's call it september 1st 
Well, to combine the hammer and the last two months questions, I last year in the main event that I was doing well in, I was trying to pr pr protect a lead. I had the hammer when Eloy came back and he fit categorically fitted fit exactly what I needed. And I thought I need to get him. I had the hammer. I bid as much as I thought it would take to definitely get him. And I ended up bidding uh, $150 too much. I wasted $150 on August 1st, which was just heartbreaking and right. ended up really affecting me. At the time, I thought I'll, $70 for the rest of the season will be enough. And it wasn't enough. I didn't feel like it was enough. I very rarely got my first choice guy after that because I like to, you know, I often will switch out three ish guys per week. So it was not enough. And I'm going to go higher than that. I don't know exactly, but $70 for the last two months turned out to not be enough is the answer. <laughs> Vlad, how about you? What's your kind of like ballparkish, what you want to be at those two spots? Well, the old rule, and I think I learned it from you. I learned it from watching you uh, like a decade ago <laughs> was uh, uh, the, the hundred dollars for the last month, like roster expansion occurs. Uh, you just, you just kind of, you have some, some money there so you can spend, you can mix and match, uh, uh, grab two steps. Uh, so, uh, that has changed a little bit. I think what happened last year uh, overall is people spent a lot faster and a lot quicker because they hadn't adjusted for the 2020 season where yeah. it was the same amount, still $1,000 budget, but you know, two thirds less of a season. And so the average bid amount was uh, was more over the course of those weeks. And so you just kind of got used to it. And so I just realized that I was I was spending this, uh, this too early. So you, you want to just you want to keep an eye in relation to your league and, and, and where you're at. So for example, if I know if I'm in a league with you or hope I'm not in a league with you, Scott, or like Larry Schechter, like I just, I know, you know, I have 150 and all of us have like 150 left in on August 1st, he's got like 800. So, yeah. you know, he's got control of the board. I don't necessarily want to do that. Um, that way I want to continue to stay uh, correctly aggressive, I guess, um, over the course of the season, but it's a balance. You really got to just feel it out for every team. And I think it's important, uh, you know, I don't know, if you have a partner on your team or someone you, you talk to, I think it's important to bounce ideas off someone. I, Vlad and I, you know, we don't uh, we don't talk about every single bit, but every once in a while he'll shoot me a message like, oh, you know, how do you feel about this person? And it, it usually ends up being that I pull his bid down a little bit and I raise my bid from talking about it. So I think having someone to bounce ideas off of is a really good idea. You can you know, maybe help yourself. You If you, you're just so stuck in on someone, you're like, I'm betting 250 bucks and everybody else is like, well, you probably get them for like 75. It at least makes you adjust and you may, you may still stick with your gut and, you know, kind of go with the higher bid. And, but I think having someone to bounce ideas off is really important because I mean, figuring out these bids is, is never easy. Yeah. Having sharing a team with Rob DiPietro this year in the tag team league, it was the first team I'd ever co-managed and it helped a lot just being able to talk to him on Sundays about fab. Yeah, it, it, it's fun too. I mean, part of this is a, a group and fun, a fun experience, and we all want to do well. But you know, it's 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 good. And I, we've all made friends, and we talk about the live events in Vegas, and it's just it's so fun to walk in that room and see you know fifty people that you have relationships with now and that you're you're friends with and, and, and can hang out with. So it's a uh, it's a great experience. I cannot recommend the live drafts uh, highly enough to everybody. It's one of those things that uh, you know the first time you might feel a little weird or like you're the person in the room you don't know anybody. Uh, I can promise you that almost everybody in that room is super nice, super genuine. You, it's amazing to me in this uh, you know so many different kinds of people almost everybody is super nice and friendly and i found that it's, it's a really great experience and definitely uh, i can't recommend uh, coming out and uh, coming out to vegas uh, highly enough and if you do um, definitely come say hi to vlad because he's really friendly mm -hmm. definitely all right thank you all so much jenny vlad scott fantastic panel i'll be re-watching this one uh maybe i'll make it to vegas we'll see i don't know nick can i hijack for five seconds i've got yes. my uh roto wear Look at that. Pitching Ninja shirt on. These the shirts, uh, these pink ones are the proceeds are going to help Emily Walden and her battle with breast cancer. So I want everybody to go out there and get one. Definitely share the link inside of the uh in Twitch chat. Oh channel. yes, I Absolutely. will. I will do that. Uh yeah, awesome, there we Scott. go. Yeah, there it is. Uh so, sorry, Nick. I had to get up, I had to get up again, but I had to show the shirt. It's in my room, my <laughs> office too. It's a fantastic shirt. I. Uh, but yeah, thank you guys so much for being a part of this. We got to move on to the next one. But yeah, share that link. Uh, go to RotoWare, support the cause um, as well. Thank Thanks, you guys. Nick. Take care. Thank you.